few people realize that monasticism was founded to combat Satan. This was the purpose of monks, to go and meet Satan face to face in the desert, one-on-one -on -one with fasting, asceticism, prayer, and defeat him, and by defeating him, help set humanity free from his grip. This is the purpose of the foundation of monasteries in the desert and monasticism. St. Anthony, right, the founder of monastis, uh, the Hermetic life, and Pacomius, monasticism, and so forth. Now, what I wish here to emphasize is that from the earliest centuries of Christianity, from the time of Christ until now, until the 12th century, exorcisms in the church were progressively on the rise. But then something bad happened in the church. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to be here with us. And hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. Anyway, for this video, I'll be sharing you a lot of very interesting stuff from Father Joseph Iannuzzi about history of exorcisms in the church, such as the clip that I shared with all of you at the start of this video. And to kick this off, I'd like to share this clip of Father Iannuzzi as he addressed some of the common myths and truth pertaining to hauntings, necromancy, which is invoking the dead that are becoming more and more a fad in primetime television. We hear about these people who call themselves channelers, mediums, psychics, and as we know, a lot of the things we see on the television movies are false. But some of it is true. Do you know that that film, The Exorcism by Peter Blatty, where that Linda Blair played the part of which in reality was a boy, not a girl, that occurred in Washington, D.C.? I went there, actually, to the house when I gave a retreat there. Um... That all began with a boy playing with a Ouija board. He didn't mean anything bad. He was just curious. All it took was that curiosity for him to be possessed. So when he went to bed, strange noises began in the attic. Then his bed started to shake, even without uh, a, a bed board. What do you call that? A box spring that goes under the mattress? His mattress was on the cement floor floor in the pastor's house. The pastor said to the mother, let him sleep here the evening and let me see what happens. The mattress started to bounce with the boy on it and the pastor got so scared he told the boy to leave. Okay, all that started out of curiosity of invoking the dead through a Ouija board. Now another case is of hauntings. Is it possible for the dead to roam the earth or a locale unaware that they are dead? I hear this sometimes. He doesn't know he's dead. She doesn't know she's dead. Well, this is a myth. The church's councils of Lyon and Florence declared that immediately, and the word they use is mox, M-O-X, immediately after death, the soul is judged and goes to its eternal destiny of salvation or damnation. That is either purgatory, heaven, or hell. So there's no teaching that comes from the church or that comes from scripture where a person dies and doesn't know they're dead. I think it's kind of offensive for someone to be told that someone's dead and they don't know it. If it's a man, all he has to do is reach for his wallet and finds it's not there, he knows he's dead. You know, something's missing that's important in my life here. <laughs> Sorry to be uh, a little bit cheeky here, but there's truth to this. Um, the, the dead go immediately to their place of judgment. Now, however, there are hauntings in places, absolutely. But this does not mean the dead do not go to purgatory, heaven, or hell. They do, but they bilocate, all right? This is important. The same dynamism occurs to the in the apparitions of Mary, Jesus, and saints. While it is true that immediately after death the soul is judged, God may in special circumstances forestall its judgment on account of the sacraments. The old 1912 Code of Canon Law allowed up to two hours for the priest to give extreme unction after the person's death. Also, we recall the case of Lazarus, right? He died, but he wasn't judged because God knew that he would be resurrected. So this was a special case where a person died, but they were not judged immediately. But this is not the norm. And now for the next clip will be a rather long clip. The question that is being addressed here will be this. There are over 1,000 references to the devil in the Bible, and of these 1,000 references, 568 come from the New Testament, 
And if in scripture so much attention is given to the activity of the devil in the world, one must ask, why is it that today such little attention is given to casting him out? And the answer to this question can be found in the church's historical decline in demonology, which will be the focus of this video as Father Iannuzzi briefly review the church's history and see how this change came about. In the first period of the church, we find that exorcisms were in full swing. The apostles were doing them, Jesus was doing them, and they were working. Then we come to the second period of the church, which is after the life of Christ and the apostles. In this period there followed the early church fathers, namely Saints Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Cyprian, as well as the early writers Origen and Tertullian relate. These relate that exorcists were found in every village and city. St. Justin Martyr wrote to his early Christian community in Rome, in quotes, Throughout the world, and indeed in your own city of Rome, there are numerous exorcists, unquote. So up until now, exorcisms are on the rise. We come now to the third period of the church which spans from the 3rd to the 6th century, and includes the great personages of saints Anthony of the Desert, Pacomius, Hilary, who withdrew to the desert to a life of prayer and fasting. Why? For the very purpose of defeating Satan, and through their spiritual combat, liberating humanity, setting it free from Satan's grasp. Other Notable exorcists of this period were Saints Marcellinus and Peter, Saints Martin of Tours and Benedict. These are more recent exorcists that established desert community not to flee Satan, but to combat Satan directly in his preferred dwelling, in the desert. In this fifth period of the church that spans from the 12th to the 15th century, the church loses its footing in its combat against Satan. It is in this period in which Satan is active that Europe is plagued with wars and disease. There was the Hundred Years' War, and women who were found to be a bit crazy were labeled witches. This was especially prevalent in Protestant circles, Salem, Massachusetts, for example. The very women that needed more than anyone else to be exorcised were instead persecuted and burned at the stake. Saint Joan of Arc is a prime example. Although Joan would be later declared a saint, she was, during the Inquisition and for political reasons, accused of being a witch. She was never exercised to prove her innocence or guilt, but dealt the common practice of the Inquisition. She was burned to the stake. Soon after the poor attempt to replace exorcisms with inquisitions and witch burnings, disaster strikes Europe. In 1340, the Black Plague rocked Europe, an epidemic that killed over 40% of the European population, followed by civil disturbances and schisms. Shortly after, there was a, an attempt to replace exorcisms with inquisitions and witch burnings. Coincidence? I don't think so. Then we come to the 6th century, which spans from the 16th to the 18th century, where the absence of exorcisms gives way to a series of persecutions. So far, history has taught us one thing. Where the devil is not combated and cast out through exorcisms, persons become demonized and are killed. Such would be the case for the centuries to follow through the atrocities carried out in Dachau, in the Gulag, through genocide and ethnic cleansing, just as the persecutions and the burning of witches had an irrational beginning, equally irrational was their cessation. And this brings us to the seventh period of a church that spanned from the 18th century to the present. The excessive and unconventional methods for dealing with evil in the Middle Ages came to a halt. Inquisitions came to a halt with the admission of another excess in place of exorcisms. Disinterest in the demonic. Thus we go from one extreme of exorcisms and stake burnings as a poor substitute for exorcisms to its antithesis, apathy in the face of evil. While the motives for this change are numerous, I limit myself to their consequences, as these brought about a disinterest in the exorcisms the apostles performed 
and a regression in demonology. So now after we've learned and listened to Father Yanuzi's explanation, the devil is reduced to a symbol, and personal force, and even a figment of the imagination. And this disinterest in the devil has not kept the people from chasing after superstitions, occultism, rationalism, materialism. And since several Christian churches have discontinued the custom of casting out demons from people in places, and even consider exorcisms distasteful, the lay people remain deprived of the salutary guidance of the shepherds where God has commissioned to lead his sheep and in his name cast out demons. And it is unfortunate, as well as not uncommon, that those who have neither seen nor participated in exorcism doubt its efficacy and others will outright deny the presence of the devil. For many of you who have followed my channel for quite some time now, you know I've mentioned several times before that Father Yanuzi worked with the late Father Gabriel Amorth on many exorcism cases before. This was made possible because Father Yanusi's superiors in Rome gave him the permission to work with Father Amorth and learn to do exorcisms under his tutelage. And according to Father Yanusi, Father Amorth would invite him every morning, five days a week, into the sacristy of the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls where they would perform about anywhere from three to ten exorcisms every morning. Although it must be noted as well that many of those cases of exorcisms were not possessions, meaning the vast majority were not full-blown possessions. They were instead demonic obsessions, oppressions, vexations, infestations, but not full-blown possessions. And then Father Yanuzi was also sent out into the States, where he was asked by a bishop or two to perform exorcisms in the U.S. as well. As we know, there is a secrecy, a confidentiality to exorcisms, as there is with confession, and this is why the many exorcists we've listened to so far don't mention names of the victims. Well, I'll refer you to an occasion I remember of Father Amorth inviting me, was of a nun, I won't mention her name, who left her vows and became a devil worshipper. Now, some of you may think, how is this possible? Well, it's possible. Yeah, she um, left her vows and started to serve Satan and became possessed. We're not talking about an affliction. We're talking about a real diabolical possession in this nun, ex-nun. Father Amorth took me to her apartment, and before entering, he told me, the, prepped me, you know. He said, this is the real possession. This is not like the other ones you've seen. So, But I won't go into that. The one I wish to mention is the one of a young Italian woman, and she was about five feet tall, five feet flat, very, you know, about up to my thyroid, <laughs> my collarbone. And she uh, was very meek, and she came with her husband. And Father Amorth would always say Mass before the exorcisms and give a homily on Jesus, the Savior, who delivers us from evil. And after the Mass, he would go into the sacristy and then begin the exorcisms. And he would place the purple stole around the afflicted person's neck, oil on their head, you know, and the crucifix, and recite the prayers from the Roman major exorcism ritual. And then the, uh, the battle began. Um, but in this one occasion, there were four people present. Father Amoth never does an exorcism alone. And wisely so, because the person that he's praying over can become violent, and that often was the case. In this particular case, there were one, two priests, myself and Father Massimo, who died recently. And then there was a Franciscan brother there, and then two charismatics, two women who have the gift of discerning spirits. Okay, Father Amoth would always work with them. And when this young little woman, five feet tall, grew violent in the presence of her husband and us, um, Father Amorth told us to each grab a limb. So, of course, two people, one person on her left grabbed her arm, the one on her right grabbed her right arm, I grabbed, put my chest on her thigh, her left thigh was on her left side, and Father Massimo did the same to her left thigh, so she wouldn't kick and punch, claw, spit, and all that. But she did anyway. And what surprised me, and I was new at the time to exorcisms, was even though she was small, she lifted me off the ground. And I was, I'd say, easily twice her weight, at least twice her weight. And this is an example of hysterical strength that cannot come from her. And also she started to blaspheme God in English. And I said, okay. But as is our custom, we don't pay attention to what the demon says because, number one, they lie. And they will lie just to get their way, so we ignore everything they say. And Father Amoth only communicates with the afflicted person. We don't. We pray. All right? After the exorcism, I asked her husband, how many languages does she speak? And he said, only Italian. And I said, no, she knows English. He said, no, she doesn't. 
and I let the conversation end there, and I realized that Satan was speaking through her in English, and she herself did not know, nor her husband, that she was speaking perfect English. Bad English in the sense that it was vulgar, but it was perfectly grammatically correct, according to the English syntax. Point of all this is, Satan is real. He's a real angelic person. And it's unfortunate that the world in which we live has become apathetic to him. And therefore, he is able to move about freely without being detected and is therefore more effective in influencing people who walk around in a slumber, not knowing he's even there tempting them. And guess who is helping Satan tempt people? The media. By the way, I'm just letting you know that the original audio of this whole thing was close to one hour, but I'm doing my best to cut it down to around 10 minutes in total for this video. That's the tricky part, which is to ensure I don't leave anything important from the original recording, but still keeping the whole thing as compact as I can. And so for the last audio clip of Father Iannuzzi that I'd like to share with you will be this. The teaching on original sin being transmitted to us by our first parents is present in the Church's early biblical and patristic tradition. I did my licentiate on patristic theology at the, Bib at the Gregorian University in Rome, and was given a grant by the Biblicum to study theology in Israel. And I mention this because I had exposure to these early church fathers that I'm sharing with you now and their teachings on original sin. Though we are conceived with original sin, we do not bear the guilt of Adam and Eve. We are not punished for original sin, but purified from it, which occurs at baptism. And the Council of Trent acknowledges that even after baptism, the inclination to sin remains in the baptized. So baptism does not do it all, you see. It begins the work of sanctification. For the last part of this video, I'd like to share something rather interesting from Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. According to him, being sensitive to the presence of demons is more common than many realize, but little understood. People often think them crazy when they share their experiences. They themselves may wonder if they are just imaging it. But really what those people who are sensitive to the presence of demons need is actually an experienced spiritual director who is knowledgeable in such matters and can guide them. But again, as Monsignor Rossetti puts it, such directors are unfortunately very rare. In any case, sensitivity often runs in families. When someone believes they have a spiritual sensitivity, Monsignor Rossetti will often ask them about their parents and grandparents. Did any of them seem to have a special spiritual knowledge or abilities? On the flip side, sadly some use their sensitivities for evil. For example, sensitivity can run in a long line of witches and occult practitioners. It is also true that more than a few people believe they have such a sensitivity, but it is only their overactive spiritual imagination. These can be spotted when their so-called insights are not corroborated by reality, or their insights become increasingly fanciful and bizarre and often self-aggrandizing. Real sensitives, on the other hand, suffer because of their gifts and largely keep them hidden. Because the reality is, experiencing the presence of demons is no fun. Demons are ugly, dark, angry, and punishing. Demons know who can sense their presence and they don't like it, and their primary defense is to remain hidden. When they're exposed, they would retaliate if they can. And usually the greater the spiritual sensitivity, the stronger the demonic retaliation. But of course, the important point that people need to always remember is that demons are only allowed to do what God allows so the sensitive soul needs to trust in God and his providence. And of course, they should enlist the normal spiritual protections. Frequent reception of the sacraments is a must, plus a solid daily prayer regimen. Sensitives not uncommonly will have a strong connection to the saints and angels as their daily helpers and companions. And it's rather comforting to know that Monsignor Rossetti and his team try not to overtax their team members, and especially those sensitives who suffer in the presence of demons. The spiritual combat takes a toll on all, and especially those who suffer when demons are present. Well then, that will be all for the video this time. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And hopefully you've learned a lot from this video and every other video that we've shared with you on this channel so far. And please remember, if there's any feedback or suggestion, please do let me know in the comments below. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. By the way, I'm trying my best to be as positive to any insults in the comments, as some of you have advised me before, and again, thank you so much to all of you for reminding that. Well then, until the next one, please stay safe, stay healthy, keep on spreading the faith, and may God bless you.